Okay. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of Isaiah and Isaiah 1. Uh, but, you know, this, this is a strange year, is it not? And I hate to lay it on you like this so early in the morning, but it's going to get worse. <laughs> it's going to be stranger as we go from now until Christmas time, and who knows what next year will bring. Uh, and uh, we as Christians look at what's going on, and those of us who believe the Bible with all our hearts, and I hope every one of you is with me on that. We may disagree on little interpretations here or there, but I hope we're together on that. Uh, those of us who believe fully in the Word of God, we are the ones who have the answers, while everybody out there is just floating around fighting. We're the ones who have the answer, and I'm not against fighting if there's a place for that, uh, but we have the answers, and our Christian faith, our biblical faith right now, is showing up to be very relevant. And sometimes we, with all the noise, it's hard to show the relevance of what we believe, and I think right now it may be a little easier to share the relevance uh, with the culture around us. So take heart. The church has always done better in bad times. So let's, let's take some courage from that. Well, my assignment, which I am very happy to have received from the pastor, uh, an overview of Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 1. And there's the Facebook picture of Isaiah. <laughs> I took a picture of my BHS Hebrew text right there at chapter 40 because there's this question in Isaiah you know, uh, the liberal scholars, by that, I'm talking about the guys over in liberal land who don't believe the Bible. I, I just call it liberal land. And they're, they're, they don't agree with each other any more than we do on our side. Uh, they fight and, and battle, and they say two Isaiahs. Some of them say three Isaiahs. Probably in another 10 years, there'll be four Isaiahs. Uh, and, but the big one is the two Isaiahs, the divide between chapter 39 and chapter 40. And I've always wondered, you know, when they found the Isaiah scroll at Qumran, I wonder how many of the liberal scholars were excited that, you know, when they rolled that thing out finally, that, that maybe it would stop at the end of chapter 39. It didn't. Kept rolling out all the way to the end. And in fact... Uh, right here, uh, see if I can mark this. They told me how I could do this. Uh, I've got to set the color first. Right here is where the column on the scroll stopped. And so you have a seamless presentation by the scribe from 39 to 40. Now, that doesn't prove the unity of Isaiah. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But it disproves, at least at that time in history, that there were two Isaiahs. At least the Qumran community didn't look at it that way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's one of the battleground things with respect to the book of Isaiah. And you and I have to fight to prove the unity of the book. Now, the outline of the book does follow 39, first 39 chapters, and the 40 through 66, there are some thematic developments there that are important, and maybe that's what generated the liberals to think there were two different Isaiahs. Uh, I'm using uh, an FOI outline that Thomas Simcox put together. Uh, the Book of Judgment, you see you could divide it up in a lot of different ways, but the Judgment of Judah, Jerusalem, first 12 chapters, Judgment of Israel's Enemies, chapter 13, the so-called burdens, the oracles uh, begin, and then the famous 24 to 27, the, the little apocalypse, it's sometimes called, the prophecies and universal judgment, the woes for Israel and Jerusalem pick up again in 28 to 35, and then some historical events with judgment foretold. And then 40 to 66, the book of consolation. Talks about the end of the Babylonian captivity, the servant of the Lord, the messianic kingdom. Now, in that, a lot of things are interwoven in throughout that. For example, in chapter 66, uh, we have uh, the doom upon the rest of the world in the midst of the messianic kingdom promises and hope. And so you see interwoven judgment and hope. Judgment and hope. And that's the way prophecy already all, all, always is. A lot of woe, 
a little hope in terms of the number of verses, but the hope is a great hope and it expands. And, and we see uh, so much in this book that could encourage us, but also that should scare us. And so as we look at that, we want to be careful to understand how God has given his book. There are themes that show the unity of Isaiah, and I'm going to stay away from the Messianic uh, ones. Uh, Arnold will take care of that, and the, the kingdom ones, Andy will take care of that. So, uh, but I thought I'd point out some others. Babylon, for example, mentioned Isaiah 13, 14, 21, 39, 47, and 48. Guess what? He covers both parts of the, quote, two Isaiahs. Holy One of Israel, that phrase, 12 times in Isaiah 1 to 39, 11 times in Isaiah 40 to 55, two times in Isaiah 56 to 66, the word son, 54 times throughout the book, child, children, offspring is a lot of that, all those terms used constantly throughout the book, and a woman with child or nursing a child, that is expressed many times, so you have that theme there too. And then the Exodus. In fact, Egypt and a hint of the Exodus is, I think, mentioned over 20 times in the book of Isaiah. Uh, it's mentioned in chapter 10 and 11 and 51. It's three major examples that I give here in, in the notes. So you have all these themes that show that you know, they cover the whole book. They're not just in one section or the other. Now here's what the liberals say in response to that unity of the book. Liberals will say, well, a redactor, an editor, went back and he saw that, and so he stuck the word Holy One of Israel back in 1 through 39 to make it appear like one guy wrote the book. Now, when you think about that, if you hold that view, you can make it say anything you want to, right? And so here's, here's what we gather from that. You will never, ever win in a conversation with liberals. They will always have something. They'll always make up new stuff to explain it away. Okay, it's like uh, talking to an evolutionist. You find something doesn't fit their thing, so they, they create, they say, well, it's, it's an anomaly or something. Same way with liberals in dealing with the actual text. It is clear that the whole book is unified, and we have that theme, 1 through 39 and 40 through 66. Even though there are distinctions in the content, there are several threads that point out that the book is one book given by God, one author. And I happen to believe he's Isaiah, as 1-1 one, one says. Now, let's get into Isaiah chapter 1. Okay, I have two, two guys up on the screen that you may be familiar with. I don't know. Uh, some of you may waste a lot of time uh, watching reruns uh, on television, uh, because frankly, a lot of the reality TV junk that's out there now is not worth looking at. Uh, but these are, by profession, who are they? Lawyers. And what we have in chapter, uh, chapter one uh, is, after you have the super, the, the super uh, Scription at the very beginning, you have a whole section. In fact, Dr. Ryrie in his study Bible refers to the whole chapter as a legal indictment. I've subdivided it a little bit more to kind of highlight the themes in a homiletical way to help, help me remember it, help, uh, maybe help me present it, maybe help you remember it. Uh, so you have an indictment, which I'm going to go verses 2 to 9, cross examination, verses 10 to 17. Offer of pardon, verses 18 to 20. Verdict, verses 21 to 23. And cleansing and release, verses 24 to 31. Now, if you took the two lawyers' pictures there and you went to the next generation, what would you have, law and order? I never quite got into that like I uh, did to the other two guys. So think in your mind, this chapter is kind of a legal rendition a legal outline for us uh, to look at. So, let's get into the details. In the superscription, we look in verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah 
and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, that covers some territory. And of course, Isaiah is the one who is prophesying right at the beginning of what's coming to be the Assyrian captivity, 722 BC, thereabouts, is where that's placed. And so he's warning about the idolatry of the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is not going to be bothered as much by this. Uh, and so he's attacking the northern kingdom. It's got false worship. It's got a false uh, place. It's gotten away from the Lord quicker than the southern kingdom. Its kings are more evil at, at this point in time. Uh, and Isaiah is making his presentations to the nation before and after that captivity. The book of Isaiah, uh, according to Dr. Ryrie, goes from about 740 B.C. to 680. Isaiah, by tradition, dies sometime during the reign of Manasseh. Manasseh starts about 696, somewhere in there. Uh, so in the tradition in Hebrews 1137, you remember that? How Isaiah died, he dies by being put in a log and sawn in half. That's an interesting way to go to meet the Lord. Um, so he was not well liked. And most of the prophets, with their statements of woes, were rejected by the majority. So, I guess that one application for us is, it's, as a pastor, you don't want to be loved by everybody. Right? If you're going to be following the Lord, there's going to be some hostility towards you. And, you know, I was a pastor for 31 years, and I, I learned, as a pastor, you either pucker up or duck. They either love you a lot or they hate your guts. There's no, there's no in between. Have you noticed that? At least that's the way I felt. Almost nobody was on the fence about my ministry. Uh, maybe your experience has been different. But this is the context of the time of Isaiah's ministry. Now we get into the legal indictment in verses 2 through 9. First thing we want to see is that it is God who gives the indictment. This is not a human complaint. This is a divine complaint. Verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord, which Yahweh, has spoken. It is God who gives this. But notice something else. The painfulness of the crime. I don't mean by this label to suggest that God feels pain in the same way that you and I feel pain. But he voices this in painful imagery. Notice what he says. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. And some of you have experienced wayward children or wayward grandchildren, and it bothers your soul. And those of us who have children, those of us who have family, struggle sometimes. And we worry like all get out when our kids are waffling in their faith. And here he uses that image. I nourished you, brought you up as children, and you just rebelled against me. He doesn't say when you became teenagers, but he says you rebelled against me. And then in verse 3, he moves to the image of animals. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. The animals have enough sense to know where to go. But Israel does not know. Even worse, it says, my people do not consider. They're not thoughtful about the things of the Lord. And God is expressing the painful. And then he goes on, it's almost a lament here, a last sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evil doers. Children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. 
and his heart is pained. That's my use of the language here. His heart is pained by the rebellion of his children. Now the very fact that he uses such strong language by application to the church, and I understand that we don't just willy-nilly, that's an Alabama term by the way, I'm from Alabama, we won't willy-nilly take Old Testament texts and drive them into the church in application. We have to be thoughtful about that. But I think there's a, a, a point here, we can do some application, and we will throughout, uh, that I think God is more pained by our sins than we think. Now, I'm not attacking grace, by the way. I believe strongly in grace. But we need to understand, even under grace, God is pained by the sin of his children. And here he's very pained by Israel going backwards, his children rebelling against him. He's nourished them and they've grown up and they've left him. And it bothers him. That's the language that he presents here. The painfulness of the crime. And then we have a real lament that begins in verse 5, I think. Why should you be stricken again? You revolt more and more. And then he comes to an illustration of physical sickness. Verses 5. Verse 5. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. So the head, you're wrong in your thinking. Your inner being, it faints. It's not there. There's no presence, no strong presence for me. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Notice the absolute way he says that. No soundness in it. It's not just a little bit. He's looking at it and making an absolute kind of statement. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. You are sick. He laments that. But then he has the illustration of defeat. Verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. You're like a nation that's been defeated. And of course, in the Assyrian captivity, that's exactly what happened. You have a nation that is defeated. It's a proper image for what's happening. He continues that, verse 8, So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth, a tent, and a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Now think about that image. A tent and a vineyard, so at least you have grapes around, but that's all. You don't have your cities, you don't have your villages. All you have is a tent and a vineyard. And you have a hut and a garden of cucumbers. You may like cucumbers, but I'm not sure that's all you want. The imagery there is that you've been wiped out. You have very little. It is a defeated nation. You're like a defeated nation as a besieged city. And of course, uh, you see in the midst of this lament and this judgment imagery, <coughs> grace. Verse 9. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Of course, they were destroyed. And we would have been destroyed if it had not been for the grace of the Lord. Of course, one of the reasons that God didn't destroy them, did they deserve it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he didn't. Why? Because of his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has a historical plan that is unconditional. And I make no apologies for believing that. I believe that's exactly what the Bible says. And there is going to be a future for national Israel. So at every step along the way, all the 12 tribes have to be preserved somehow. I don't care if you think they're lost. God knows where they are. He's going to bring them all back. He's already brought out so many. And there's going to be 
an ongoing forever presence of Israel. It's part of God's plan. So there has to be this statement of grace. But by way of application, again, we have a gracious God. Cover to cover in the Bible, it doesn't matter what dispensation you are in, you see God's grace. And so we need to understand that. And take some heart from that. And then we move from uh, the indictment part of the passage to cross-examination. Okay, I think of Perry Mason coming up to the stand now to really uh, run somebody through. Or Matlock twisting them up and, and making them know that they're guilty and actually, actually say they are. Uh, but here, the, in the cross-examination, there's, there's questions. And some of the questions, the first two, I think, are actually... Uh, stated as questions. I think then there are four more that are kind of implied questions. And so I've worded them in the notes as questions. First is, why do you bring sacrifices? I've just stated how bad you are. Here's, here's what I said. Here's the indictment. In light of this, the way you are and all these things, why do you bring sacrifices? Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Years ago, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember the crazy days of the 1960s. And this year has reminded me of that. Um, but in the early 70s, when we had Watergate, and there was a particular preacher uh, who they said had the ear of Nixon, President Nixon. And I, I heard him preach one time, and he said, people say that I had the ear of President Nixon. I don't want his ear, and neither does God. I want his heart. God wants the heart. And here, the outward things, the sacrifices. People come and do it. It's just a thing that they do over and over and over. It's like rote, and you just do it. But their heart is not in it. Just like some of the people in our churches. In fact, on some Sundays, just like you. I've pastored for 31 years, and I, tell, I don't know how many Sundays I went through the motions, but there were some. It comes around with regular monotony. Now, if you're a pastor and you think like that, that's bad. There needs to be some excitement about the word, right? But we're human beings. And so we struggle with those things. And it's very easy to slip back into just doing the activity without the spiritual punch. And here they were doing sacrifices without meaning. And God calls them on it. And this isn't the only place in the Bible that that's said, of course, as we know. But then uh, he also asked the question, not just about the sacrifices, he's, why do you trample my courts? Uh, look what he says, verse 12, when you come to appear before me, talking about, I think, the, giving the sacrifices, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? He refers to them coming to give their sacrifices as a trampling of his courts in the temple. God's viewing it that way. And who required you to do that? I didn't require you to come with a heart that was not in it. He brings up the sacrifices again in verse 13. Uh, but he expands that into the festivals and special days. Why keep the festivals and special days? That's the implied question. 
bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense, representing prayer, is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meat. You see those two things together? I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your solemn gatherings when you are sinners who won't deal with your sin. I can't endure that, God says. And that's where the northern tribes were that he was speaking to. With their false worship. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along here. Um, but then in verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Spread out your hands to do what? Pray. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. So why do you pray? Everything else you do is useless, so why do you pray to me? You're involved in false worship, and you're trying to worship me too. Why pray? I'm not going to answer. Are you depressed yet in this passage? Um, I have a sermon on why so much prophecy is negative. Why do you not deal with evil? Verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Stop it. Before you bring your sacrifices, do away with the evil. And then why do you not pursue righteousness? The other side of that. Verse 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. That's biblical justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. And I'll have more to say about that a little bit later. So in this cross-examination, the, lawyers, and the lawyer happens to be God. And here he seems to be the prosecutor and not the advocate. And in his cross-examination, why do you bring sacrifices? Why do you trample my courts? Why do you keep the festivals and special days? Why do you pray? Why don't you deal with evil and... And pursue righteousness. Your heart's not any of this. So why do you go through the motions? That's what he's saying. But then we come to the offer of pardon. And we have, okay, how many of you think that's a pretty picture up there? Okay. I don't. <laughs> I'm from Alabama. I hate snow. Uh, I lived in... Uh, the Scranton, Pennsylvania area when I was at Baptist Bible Seminary. I hated the snow then. They told me I'd get used to it. Never happened. <laughs> snow may look pretty sometimes on a postcard. Okay. But in real life, no. But that's the image that God gives. It's the most famous verse in this chapter. Verse 18. Come now and let us Reason together, says the Lord. And so there's this offer of pardon in these three verses, 18 through 20. So let's reason together. Think this through with me, I think is the idea. Think this through with me, God says. Though your sins are like scarlet, you're thoroughly a sinner through and through. They shall be as white as as snow, gone, cleansed, no more redness. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thinking of the wool on a white sheep, I think, is the idea there. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, I don't think here he's talking about individual salvation. There's no salvation by works here. He's talking about the nation coming back to him. Well, as people getting right with him and doing right in the land, and you shall eat the good of the land. And then on the flip side, the rejection side, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. 
God holds both out, both prospects. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, there's the offer of pardon right in the middle after the cross-examination. An offer of pardon. Maybe you could look at that as a plea deal. The lawyers working together, plea deal. But now we come to the verdict. In verse 21, begins a series of metaphors for a guilty verdict. The guilt has already been displayed in the complaint, in the charge, in the indictment, in the cross-examination. But here he fleshes out what I'm calling a verdict. And in these metaphors, he begins with one that's a common one in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, harlotry, verse 21. How the faithful city, and I think he's going to Jerusalem, or their city, Samaria, in Judah it had been Jerusalem, but representing the nation, has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now Murderers, So harlotry and murder, two metaphors, which I think talk about spiritual things. It could be that they're committing sexual immorality as part of that, but I think the whole point is they have, they have cheated on God with their false worship. And the murder, same idea, I think, spiritual. Silver is tainted, verse 22. Your silver has become dross. Your wine is diluted, mixed with water. Nothing is as it should be because you are guilty. I want to stop here a little bit and talk about possible application to us uh, about the, I'm going to use harlotry as an example. And I want to take you over to the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2. And in particular, I want to take you to everybody's favorite church. You think of the seven churches and, and you, you do your sermons on Ephesus and you do sermons. Now, maybe you do a sermon on all of them. I hope you do. Uh, but we talk about Ephesus. We talk about Laodicea. And we got the rapture passage in Philadelphia. So, but everybody's favorite church to talk about is Thyatira, right? Thyatira, I personally think there's a chiastic structure to this uh, chapters two and three. And I think Thyatira is the point, the, the tip of the spear, and what God, the main point that God is trying to communicate in the seven letters. Now there's a lot of details in each one that we need to take into account. Uh, uh, and I'm not talking about the historicist understanding of the letters. I'm talking about specific application to all the churches. As it says in each letter, uh, to the one who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So there's intended application of all of these to us today. And what do we see here? Uh, after the initial statements, beginning in verse 18... You come down, verse 20, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. I'm in chapter 2, verse 20. I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, I take the sexual immorality here as literal. I know some commentators take it as a spiritual immorality, you know, getting away from God, like I just said uh, in the metaphor, and eating things sacrificed to idols. I think they're actually doing that. In Thyatira, there was the guilds, guild system, and they were uh, the Christians who, like, like if you were a metal worker, like belonging to the 
metal union. And so you went to their meetings, and their meetings were filled with, guess what, <coughs> sexual immorality and worship of the false gods, including eating the meat offered to idols. So I take all of that as literal. But there's the spiritual implication of that. That to do that, to get away from God in that way, is to commit spiritual idolatry and uh, all those things. So we need to understand that. Now what is God's response to that? Well, you, well first, let's go back up. This is something that again, is transdispensational. It doesn't matter where you are in the landscape. Pergamum had the same problem. Ephesus mentioned it too. But Pergamum, if you go back up to Pergamum, uh, in verse, you know, place where Satan's throne is, verse 13, look in verse 14 of the same chapter. But I have a few things against you, Pergamum, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And then it mentions the Nicolaitans. And I think the Nicolaitans is a group that basically does the same thing that the Jezebel faction in Thyatira. So I think it was a Nicolaitan group who taught that it was okay to get involved in the worship of the, of the pagans to mix their faith with those things. And the, the image it uses, the historical uh, illustration, goes back to Balaam. Do you remember the story of Balaam? If you go back to Numbers, why don't you go over there with me, please? Numbers. In chapter 25 of Numbers, Of course, there, the children of Israel remember the back and forth there with Balaam, uh, the kings of Moab and others, you know, and they haven't gone into the promised land yet. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 25, the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. That was literal. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. They're talking about Israelites doing this. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Now, Balaam is not mentioned there specifically, but you go a couple chapters over, chapter a few chapters over, chapter 31. Verse 16, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So you have in the Old Testament an illustration of what was happening in the, in the churches in Asia Minor. That sin problem has some constancy throughout history. And it involves sexual immorality. It involves uh, eating meat offered to idols and involves what we would call in these other metaphors that I've listed here, a silver that's tainted, a wine that's diluted, a faith that is mixed. Along with that is corrupt leaders, verse 23 in Isaiah 1, back to Isaiah your princes are rebellious and com companions of thieves. You know, when I, two, this is uh, the first time I have spoken to a, uh, this is the first time I traveled yesterday, first time I traveled on an airplane since the COVID lockdown. And that was interesting. That was interesting. Uh, two weeks ago, I spoke for the first time to people in person. I do a lot of teaching. I'm, I'm teaching a theology class for our overseas interns and people in Poland and Ukraine. So I do that kind of stuff. And I haven't been able to do the flying around. I had a trip to Israel canceled, a trip to Australia canceled. You know, it's, it's hard to get stuff done, it seems. It's fighting against us, so to speak. Um, but in the church two weeks ago when I spoke, they all wore masks. And, you, you know, that's hard to preach to an auditorium full of bandits. <laughs> 
So in here, we only have a few bandits. <laughs> uh, and I don't object if you wear a mask or not. I'm just saying, they're just weird. It's just hard. But here, I, and I, what, what brought that on, that, that, that moment of insanity on my part, uh, uh, was the mentioning there of thieves, companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. There is absolute rebellion. And what they are doing is mixing their faith. They're trying to worship the Lord plus do all these other things. Do we do that? Now, later on, Ezekiel will tell us some things. If you want to hold your place there in Isaiah, let's go to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. And the southern tribes will go through some of the same similar kinds of things when their time comes for judgment. And Ezekiel, during the Babylonian captivity, is rehearsing these things for them and is talking about the harlotry of Jerusalem then, the same way the harlotry of the northern tribes is dealt with by Isaiah. And he's talking about spiritual harlotry, although there is legitimate sexual immorality as part of that. But you come all the way down to verse 48 in Ezekiel 16. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Notice he's going to use the Sodom and Gomorrah kind of uh, illustration from history. I'm going to say Jerusalem is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And look what I did to them. And he can't destroy Jerusalem because he made a promise to Abraham. Okay, so he's got to deal differently there. Um, but look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Abomination, there's the homosexuality that we read about in the Genesis account. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. And he's saying the sin of Jerusalem is, was worse than that. Now you put all those things together, the pride, the fullness of food, abundance of idleness, not taking care of the poor and needy and the abomination. The word to describe all that, I think, is self-indulgence. They were a self-indulgent culture. And God judged them for it. And I think one of the symptoms of that, externally, is the homosexuality. Of course, we understand how that debate's going in our day. And it's not going in a direction that favors what you and I believe in our culture. These are strong statements. And they apply to things we see today. I mean, they, they're matching things we see today. Maybe, I, I think there's somewhere in the Bible says something like there's nothing new under the sun. And so we need to, remit, to think, seriously think about, we've got corrupt leaders and lack of compassion for the needy because we are so self-indulgent as a culture. And when we do that, we mix our faith with other things. And that's exactly where we are right now. Then we come down to verse 24 to 31, and here is a terebinth tree, uh, probably from the Middle East in the picture. Notice in verse 24, It talks about purification by judgment. And God declares there will be judgment and there will be a resolving of the sin question and there will be cleansing of the nation. And this is part of the hope of the passage. I mean, you know, I, mean I, I don't really get up in the morning and pray, Lord, would you purify me today by judgment? I, most of us don't pray that way, but that's going to happen here. 
Purification by judgment. Verse 24, back to Isaiah 1. Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. Okay? On my enemies. But notice how he says in verse 25, I will turn my hand against you. Talking to Israel. And thoroughly purge away your dross. And the dross... Uh, you think about dross, that's rubbish or trash or garbage. We're going to thoroughly purge away that bad stuff that you have, the garbage that's in your life, and take away all your alloy. Remember alloy is what? Mixed metals? The pure metal was something else put in it? And there are for different reasons for application of that in modern times or even in old times, but he's using that image of mixing of bad stuff with Faith it says, I'm going, to, I'm going to, it's like cancer, I'm going, to jerk, jerk, I'm going to jerk it out of you. So you don't have it there. And that implies, the word for that syncretism. I talk about mixed faith, syncretism. That's the problem. And then in chapter 20, uh, verse 26, the restoration of righteousness. I will restore your judges as at the first. I don't think he's talking about the United States Supreme Court there. <laughs> and your counselors, as at the beginning. And I don't know that he has a particular point in time. I think he's just pointing to, we're going to go back and get better guys like we used to have. And afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city, using the city imagery again there. Uh, for that. But Zion, verse 27, shall be redeemed with justice, biblical justice, and her penitence with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together as those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. <clears throat> Have you ever read Revelation 19? When Jesus comes back, what does he do? Oh yeah, he sets up a beautiful, wonderful kingdom filled with righteousness and goodness. Amen? Something else he does when he comes back. He kills people. Not with a machine gun. By the power of his word. Sword hanging out of his mouth. The power of his word destroys his enemies. They die. So with all the grandeur and hope, there's also the negative judgment. And you and I as Christians cannot duck those tough statements. And at the end of the millennium, great white throne judgment, do you take that face value? I hope you do. It's serious business. What we're about. And the terebinth tree he mentions uh, going the rest of it, total judgment of the unrighteous, the worship of false gods is judged. For they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees, which you have desired. But where did that come from? Well, these were places of idol worship. And you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades. You're going to be like a tree that has no leaves. And as a garden that has no water, the strong shall be as tender and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together and no one shall quench them. My judgment is sure. There is nothing that is going to stop. What a way to end chapter one. Powerful. Judgment, imagery, glimpses of hope throughout. But God, as a prosecutor and as a judge, challenging his people. So what? I've thrown out a few nuggets of so what as we went through there. Let me just make a few comments. 
I don't know if you've heard, but this is an election year. <laughs> and I just want to remind you, God is not up for re-election. And the day after the election, or the month after election, or two months, whenever we know, <laughs> whenever we know, the, the very next minute after we know, God is still sovereignly in control of the universe. Romans 8.28 will always be in the Bible. All things work together for good to those who love God and those called according to his purpose. Our trust is not in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party. Our trust is not in those things. As tools, obviously, we can use them in life. But our faith and our confidence should be in the Lord. And these Israelites, there as the Assyrians were coming in and after that, they were struggling with really trusting the Lord. And like I said before, there are common temptations and sins throughout history. And I want to be careful with that. We're the church, we're not Israel. We're a church and we're not a nation. Political sense, but still, the temptation to mix truth and error Syncretism is always with us. Let me give you an illustration. I, in my church in Scranton that I started, we were doing a Sunday night small group Bible study. And in that Bible study, there was a young couple. They had started coming to my church, and they were a, a very thoughtful couple. Not dead center where we were theologically, uh, but somehow in my lesson, I don't think my lesson was about that, but capital punishment came up. And I don't know about you, but capital punishment is biblical. God has ordained that. And he doesn't give deterrence uh, as, a, as a reason. He gives because if you murder somebody wrongfully, you are basically killing God in effigy. They are made in the image of God. So that's the reason that he gives when Noah comes off the boat. You remember that. Well, that came up in our discussion, the whole idea. And they were very upset. I mean, visibly angry that I was for capital punishment. Now, I'm not for, you know, I'm not hang them high every time something happens. I'm not that way. I believe in due process. There's plenty of due process in the Bible. But they were just upset that any Christian anywhere would do that. And I thought to myself, and I went to the passages, and they looked at those passages, and they, they said, can't be true. That lacks compassion. Can't be true. I asked them, what about the compassion on the victims? I mean, but what they did, they had a Christian version of faith. And I, you know, I, to this day, I don't know if they were saved. They surprised they didn't hang around my church that long. Boy. But they were mixing it with cultural things. And when you mix modern notions of compassion with faith, biblical faith, what you end up doing is denying the truth of the Bible. That's a little bit what's going on. And I'll close with this. One more passage to go to. And then you'll give your fingers a rest. First Kings. Chapter 11. Verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor are they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts away your hearts after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives 
princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And I think, how can a man who is so wise be so stupid? Isn't this astounding? For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father, David. And then verse 6, come down to verse 6. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's the phrase I want you to stick in your heart. And did not fully follow the Lord. He mixed his faith with false things. And you and I can learn from that in the church of the 21st century. In 2020 America, we need to have a pure faith. Not like the Israelites in Isaiah's day. We need to have a faith where we follow fully after the Lord. Hold nothing back. No reservations. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your written word. And I pray you'd help us to learn from it. I think of myself and the struggles I have being so filled with the culture that I live in. I pray, Lord, you'd help me not to mix my faith with what's around me, but to follow you fully, your word, without reservation. Help me not to give up in that pursuit. In Jesus' name, I pray.